Hello! Our story begins on Mustafar in the middle of an intense standoff between Master and Apprentice. A duel of the fates. A fight between brothers. A decade of friendship destroyed in moments and the balance of everything set in this moment. If Obi-Wan could defeat Vader, then Sidious would lose his apprentice. Kenobi believed that Yoda would be able to defeat Sidious, so it was only a matter of patience for him to defeat Skywalker. Their duel moved from the Mustafar facilities down above the Lava River. The speed and ferocity of their fight was a culmination of a full life of dedication to the Blade. The combined knowledge and strength used throughout the war and everything that preceded it ended here. All their spars and lessons met for one final stand. Obi-Wan knew his strength was in the defense, but he could not keep up this pace for much longer. Anakin followed Obi-Wan off a large piece of the main structure that broke off. Obi-Wan found himself on one of the mining drones that maneuvered around the lava banks of the planet. Anakin swiftly dismounted and found himself on a small drone to call home before he re-engaged with Obi-Wan. There was a moment of peace surrounded by the fires of the destroyed bond. Obi-Wan and Anakin smashed their blades together again. The speed of their blades was unseen. With so much time and experience against each other, it could only go this way. Skywalker was able to get enough room on the small platform that Obi-Wan was standing on, and their fight was enclosed in a tight space. They spun their blades around, and within moments they collided in one strike. Before either of them knew it, Obi-Wan had dismounted onto the banks of the Lava River. Anakin looked up. It was a high ground, and he couldn't believe it. Obi-Wan was really going to try this against him. Skywalker would not fall for it. As Obi-Wan tried warning Anakin against doing so, young Vader dismounted, but not towards Obi-Wan. He just let the little drone move far enough down the river where he could just jump safely off. Anakin could tell that Obi-Wan was wearing down, and he dismounted with the hopes that Anakin would make a terrible mistake or surrender the fight. Neither happened, and Anakin was able to launch himself up the riverbed and collide with Obi-Wan's blade again. The ashen soot under their feet fled from their boots after each step they took. This proved to be the end for Obi-Wan's fight against his former student. He slipped down part of the bank and lost his balance. It's not that he would have been able to hold on for much longer anyways, but Anakin's blade crossed Obi-Wan's abdomen and he fell over. The cut wasn't all that deep, because not even Skywalker thought he would land that strike. Obi-Wan's blade slid softly into the sulfur, and he bent over in extreme pain. Skywalker saw this as the end for his former master. He placed his boot up against Obi-Wan's shoulder and forced him down the river bank. Kenobi tumbled back, flipping over himself and bending his body in uncomfortable positions beyond his control. His boot slid down to the bottom of the river bank, and he felt this immeasurable heat radiate from the surface of the lava river. He felt his stomach before looking back over his shoulder and seeing lava fire crawl up his legs. The fire was cold upon the delicate touch, but within moments the heat was overbearing. Anakin just looked down in shame, if only Obi-Wan had joined him. There was no point in finishing the job, his master was gone. Anakin gave a last look at the river banks, which were now engulfed in fire, before turning away and walking away. The sounds of Obi-Wan's screams echoed into the air, and they slowly dissipated the further Anakin got away from Kenobi. At the bottom of the riverbed, Obi-Wan cried out in agony as he was covered in fire and he felt his flesh rip from his body. There was truly nothing more painful that he'd ever experienced in his life until this, he tried to get away from the fire, but every move he made didn't make a difference. By the time he finally looked up the riverbed, Anakin had vanished into the smoke. This was heartbreaking enough. Not only did Anakin destroy everything he loved, kill everyone he cared about, but in what seemed to be his final moments, he didn't care to stay. What a terrible sensation. Obi-Wan crawled up a little bit more and felt his eyes grow heavy on him. The pain became so great that it was numb to feel, not like losing all of his skin made much of a difference for what kind of pain he could feel. He could hear, far away from him, the sound of a ship lifting off and disappearing into the atmosphere. His one chance at escaping this hell was gone. Obi-Wan climbed up a little more, trying to get a hold of anything, but he couldn't. The soft touch of sulfur ash and soot filled the crevices in his skin. From his toes to his chest, he was in an unbelievable amount of pain, and yet he couldn't understand why he wasn't dead. After what felt like eons, the flames finally died out, and he was left a husk of flesh baking above a lava river. Thoughts rushed through his mind, but all he could focus on was anguish. He moved his body up as far as he could, not really making any distance. If his skin was made of metal, maybe he could ascend the bank, but there was no hope in doing that with fingers burnt down to the bone. Obi-Wan rolled over and looked up into the sky. The sound of explosions ringing out next to him and around him deafened him. As he lay on his back, his hands fell gently onto his chest, and he listened to nothingness. His eyes drifted up into the sky until all he could see is darkness. A wave of calmness washed over him, and he vanished from the pain he toiled in. It was a weird occurrence. His skin trembled like he was shivering, and then he heard Qui-Gon's voice call out to him. It was accompanied by many other voices. Most of them were Jedi he knew, some that he was friendly with, but the main voice he picked up on was Qui-Gon. Though nothing said from these other voices was all that recognizable. The words weren't really words. They were like syllables linked with other syllables without much structure. Kenobi heard a few words that were recognizable and a chill ran down his spine. His eyes jolted open to the sound of a starcraft hovering over him. 
It was the end. Surely it was the end. It had to be Anakin coming to finish off the job or even Sidious coming to kill him or take him for some kind of prison or torture or whatever it could be. But the odd thing is, Obi-Wan, despite all of his pain, couldn't pick up on anything. Not a feeling on any living beings to the Force. Did he lose his ability to use the Force? He slightly turned his head, and it was incredibly hard for him to do so. But he heard a small little chirp. Obi-Wan twisted his body as best as he could, and he saw a little blue astromech. What was more heartbreaking? Anakin abandoning Obi-Wan on Mustafar, or forgetting that he told R2 to wait at the ship and never going back for him? Obi-Wan's heart fluttered with joy. One of the most diabolical droids he'd ever encountered had just come to save his life, presumably. The little droid moved down the lava bank and slowly and carefully leaned over and looked at Obi-Wan. The droid beeped at Kenobi and he forced a smile, which was extremely painful. Obi-Wan reached out his hand and patted R2 on the side and thanked him for being here with him. The little droid let out a couple more whistles before using his jetpack and launching into the air. R2 got into the vessel and lifted it up ever so slightly and cruised it down beneath Obi-Wan. It was a very delicate process and it took several minutes to complete. Once it was, Obi-Wan was slid into the cockpit and lifted off into space. It was hard for Obi-Wan. He couldn't tell what he was feeling. At first, he thought he wanted to be cooled off, but the cool air was too much for him. The heat was also too much. There was a lot for him to take in and none of it made any sense to him. R2 tried to communicate with Obi-Wan, but he was fading in and out of consciousness. R2 was unaware of the Polis Masa meetup location, so he took Obi-Wan to the closest place he could. It wasn't much, but it was a medical facility on a freighter. It was owned by a grouping of traveling medics, but they weren't living. It was just a ship full of astromechs and other medical droids. R2 accidentally picked up on their frequency and brought Anakin's starfighter into their freighter. By the time they arrived, Obi-Wan was nearly dead. But thanks to the work of the medical droids inside of the vessel, they were able to get Obi-Wan into a Bacta tank. The ship was created before the Clone Wars started, and when the person who chartered the vessel was killed, they never turned off the droids, so they just kept doing what they were programmed to do. It was a philanthropist who was trying to make the galaxy better. It was just a shame he got caught in the crossfire of the war. Regardless of that, he ended up saving Kenobi's life. The burning scars were bad, but his inability to breathe is what was really almost killing him. But because they were on a freighter, Obi-Wan was completely safe from the Empire and from the Sith. Though this did mean that Yoda assumed Kenobi had died on Mustafar, which left him with a hard choice to make. He wasn't the only one stuck with a hard choice. On Naboo, Anakin was able to get Padme to a medical facility but she was asking about Obi-Wan the entire time there. She of course was happy that Anakin seemed to be alright, though in the state she was, it was more so her being confused and forgetting about everything that led up to her being knocked out. She just kind of remembered that Obi-Wan was there, and because they were friends of 13 years, she wanted to be sure that her friend was alright. Especially because Obi-Wan had so much care for both her and Anakin. And while this ticked off Anakin, he was kind of sitting in this high. He hadn't really come back down to the ground yet. He was still convinced he could overthrow the Emperor and take over the galaxy and rule things the way he wanted to rule them. It was a sick mindset, but his delusions got the best of him, and with Padme knocked out, she couldn't really protest his insolence. He was acting irrational and it needed to be stopped, but at this point, who could or would stop him? The Jedi were mostly dead aside from the 1% of survivors of the Purge, and Sidious wasn't about to allow his people to betray him or become more powerful than him. It was a shame that Anakin chose to go to Naboo, like Palpatine wouldn't have spies on the planet waiting to inform him of Skywalker's arrival. The irony is that Palpatine didn't even expect Anakin to do something so rash, but he did, and so it left Anakin completely unaware of Sidious's knowledge of him being on Naboo. Sidious could make a number of choices here. He could try and make Anakin suffer for disobeying orders, he could allow Anakin to enjoy this moment, or he could continue to manipulate Skywalker, which is exactly what he would do. <laughs> Under the cover of night, Sidious would arrive on Naboo walking under his deviously dark robes. His arrival to the hospital would awaken Skywalker from sleep. Padme was still sedated and hadn't given birth yet. Anakin was very surprised to see Sidious here, but the Dark Lord made it very evident that he was here for Anakin. With the way the Force worked, Sidious knew he wouldn't be able to just kill Anakin and get away with it. Chances are this child of Anakin's would be the Force's way to take down the Sith. Sidious needed to ensure that this did not happen, so he prepared what would be a manipulation of the entire Skywalker family. Anakin was only confused when he woke up, but Sidious told him that he would be here for Anakin and his family, no matter what they needed. The madness that brought Anakin into his full Vader form on Mustafar had vanished. Obviously being woken up had that effect on him, but he was no longer focused on ruling the galaxy. He was kind of in this moment here, and having Sidious in front of him kind of made those feelings and thoughts dissipate. However, with Sidious suggesting he was here to ensure everything went smoothly, Anakin felt a lot calmer. There was still this notion for Anakin that Padme might die in childbirth, and with the Master of the Dark Side here, he believed that maybe he could save his wife from what Palpatine believed was certain death. On the other side of the galaxy, drifting through space on a directionless course, Obi-Wan was lowered into a soothing liquid of the Bacta tank. 
Kenobi was drifting in and out of consciousness on the short trip from the vessel to the Bacta tank. He was delicately placed onto a stretcher and then brought over to the Bacta tank, but it was a little bit chaotic. He was flashing through moments of his life, and then to the present. He wasn't really sure why or what was going on, but it was a bit too much to handle. He heard people calling out to him in broken voices, and yet only a few of them he latched onto. He could hear Satine and Qui-Gon. After them, it was Cody and Yoda and Windu. Didn't stop there because he heard Anakin and Ahsoka and Padme too. It wasn't in any particular order, but there was at least some semblance of shame for the losses of Satine, Qui-Gon, and Anakin, as those were the voices he latched onto the most. Obi-Wan switched through the back to tank, not realizing he was being put through a healing process. His skin was so badly burned, and he would never be able to live without some sort of breathing apparatus. All of these were physical limitations that he had yet learned about. Kenobi had no clue he had gone through such a traumatic event. All he could feel was a shock going through his body. His mind was set in such disarray he couldn't pull himself together. All he could do was live with the endless amount of grief that had always beset his poor and forsaken soul. Obi-Wan launched upwards from the back to tank, his eyes open with crust tearing on his eyelids and veins crossing the stars in his eyes. He crept over and beckoned out a question to a lifeless vessel. He asked where Padme was and if she was alright. All that he got was a number of medical droids demanding he go back into the back to tank. He had a lot of healing to endure. Little R2 rolled around the corner and beeped at him a couple times, which didn't give him much insight into what Obi-Wan asked. R2 didn't know either, but the little droid was desperately trying to reach some sort of ally, one that had no connection to Skywalker or Sidious that could help Obi-Wan. This wasn't R2 on some mission based off of revenge, it was simply him trying to get help for Obi-Wan, knowing that Anakin or Palpatine wouldn't offer anything remotely close to help. R2 turned around and rolled out of the room, trying to find a communication device he could tap into. It's not like the Jedi Starfighter had anything for him to use to contact the Jedi, considering Skywalker disconnected anything relating to the Jedi before leaving the temple on Coruscant. R2 was trying to find anyone to come and help, and yet it wasn't really getting him anywhere. He tried to find Yoda, considering the two of them had a mission not too long before these events transpired, but he got nothing. As R2 drove away, Obi-Wan was lowered back into the back of the tank, and his skin trembled under the crushing weight of the cooled liquid. He could feel something so different, like the last several hours weren't already a fever dream, but he couldn't feel his lungs. It was like he's being disconnected from the ability to breathe while being able to breathe. It didn't make a ton of sense, but obviously he was able to breathe because of the apparatus in his mouth. The amount of pain coursing through his body was met with an adrenaline that put him into a constant high, and when he was transported back into the series of visions and confusion, he was lost again. On Naboo, Sidious brought his plan into fruition by using the Force to make it seem like Padme would die in childbirth, and at that last second, he and Skywalker used the Force to save her life. All of this in quotations. Padme was in reality never in any danger. At least after she was saved, Anakin thought she was fine. Sidious had other plans for Amidala, especially considering she was a resistance to his plans. She'd be difficult to manage in the Senate, and that's not something Palpatine wanted to deal with. She wouldn't leave Naboo alive, and he was sure of that. Though, the Skywalker twins would need to be kept safe. Since Palpatine was a master planner, he began to source together a series of ideas to make sure he killed Padme and seduced Skywalker's remaining family to the dark side. It would be a top tier gaslighting, and he was giddy over which option he would choose. So many choices, he just had to make the right one. For weeks there would be silence in the galaxy. A few Jedi would be found and killed by clone troopers, but aside from that, nothing. Yoda had made his decision and vanished to Dagobah, hiding away from the galaxy until he felt the time was right. Maybe there would be a future hope. Without knowledge on Skywalker's location, or even the knowledge of the pregnancy of Padme Amidala, there was no real reason for him to believe that there were twins that could become the future lords of the Sith. Obi-Wan, on the other hand, was kept inside the back to tank the entire time, which was doing wonders for him, because he wasn't being taken out of the back to tank and he was allowed to let his skin heal. There is still so much damage, most of it being permanent, that would scar him forever, but at least he was healing. If he stayed in the back to tank, he actually might be able to come out with some semblance of who he used to be. The medical droids noted over the couple weeks that his skin cells were rebuilding and that there were hair particles on his head and face that were resurfacing. He would be a man covered in scars, but at the very least he could probably grow his hair out in time. Time would tell, though, how far that would get him. It was a difficult thing to work on for the medical droids, especially as they were preparing some sort of breathing apparatus for him to use once he was able to get out of the back to tank. There was just about nothing in the galaxy that would be able to heal his lungs but he would be stuck with some sort of breathing apparatus until he died. At least for Obi-Wan, he was mellowing out a little bit more in his mind. His visions and memories weren't focusing on the darkness that resided on Mustafar, rather they became kind of barren. There were some things that popped up, but nothing too drastic. This isn't to say that Obi-Wan was over what had happened, more or less he was just calming down and relaxing in the back to tank, becoming one with the Force. The truth is that if he was tense and disgruntled, the healing process would be much more arduous for him. 
so he personally elected that it would be much better for him to focus on the Force and allow the medics and the Force to heal him altogether. Peace in mind and body. It wasn't really easy to do, but it took the remaining of his strength to do it. Because he was fighting off demons and trauma, it was very difficult to do. If he could overcome these struggles in his mind, he'd permit himself to have a much more productive healing process. Obi-Wan knew, subconsciously at least, that before the Battle of the Fist comes the Battle of the Mind. And while that particular saying applied to actual battles, it was the same case with anything and everything in life. If he could master his mindset and focus himself on determination rather than self-loathing pity, he'd be able to thrust himself back into a place that was much more sustainable to live in. It took the entire duration of the couple weeks, and struggles with it continued to pop up, so it's not like once he was able to master his mindset he was home free. No, it was a consistent focus for him. He had to always be at the top of his game, and he had to always have his mindset at its best. Sidious, on the other hand, had chosen his path. He knew what he would do with Padme, and so, as a way to force Skywalker to lose trust for the clones, he made the clones an enemy as he did the Jedi. A group of clone commanders went into the senator's hospital room, slit her throat, and took the children. They were instructed to take the children to a hidden location on the planet. The commander squad was informed by Sidious that they'd be kept safe. This was further from the truth. A group of about a dozen regs accompanied the commander squad, and when Vader and Sidious returned from their little talk, they found Padme dead in her bed and the children missing. Of course, a couple of hospital staff were killed in the process, but thanks to the Imperial loyal Captain Panaka, they were able to go and find these individuals. Sidious told his apprentice that he would continue to scour the city for the children, just in case it was a diversion. At this point, as per Sidious's plan, they didn't know that it was done by clones. It was just an assumption by Vader that the Jedi had done this. He sped out into the plains of Naboo looking for Luke and Leia, rage building up within him. This obviously for Skywalker had no trace of leading back to Sidious. It couldn't be him. Everything Sidious did was help him. It was the Jedi who were obviously always jealous or holding him back. Of course, this was always a complete fabrication of his mind. Eventually, he saw a small amount of smoke billowing out of the forest. It had to be them. The Jedi were so stupid, it wasn't Jedi. Vader crept around the trees to see a couple of clones bundled together. They didn't mention anything about the mission they were on, just basic clone banter, until one of them was lifted off their feet. Instead of being choked, lightning sprayed out of Vader's hands and he fried the clone trooper to a crisp. The other clones got up and turned around under the assumption that Vader was a Jedi, based on his robes. Their weapons were raised, and all that would be remembered of these clones were their screams of terror as they were cut down one by one. These weren't quick and easy deaths either, they were torturous and cruel. Skywalker had the clones dying of pain before he left them to actually die, alone in the forest without anyone to help them. It was a horror movie, and that's what Skywalker was okay with doing. He allowed them to lay on the ground with missing limbs, unable to defend themselves, or feed themselves, or really anything. Most of the survivors that encountered Anakin would either starve to death or die of dehydration. Some of them would be killed by natural predators, or simply being eaten alive by a hive of bugs. Truly nightmarish stuff and it's all what Sidious was hoping Vader would do. It would push his apprentice further into the dark side. It did indeed get better. Because they were on Naboo, Sidious learned of a Jedi who escaped. It was a Jedi Knight, and so he simply shifted the blame onto the Jedi, saying that the Jedi ordered these clones, who betrayed the Empire, to go and do this. Sidious promised with all of his loving heart that he would protect the children while he was gone. This is where Sidious mimicked a bond that would typically be shared between children and their parents, making himself irreplaceable. Vader would slaughter the Jedi Knight and return to his master with a lightsaber of the deceased Jedi. They would return to Coruscant after the funeral of Padme Amidala. Padme's family would share their love with Anakin, giving a sense of family before he was whisked away back to Coruscant. Sidious made it very clear to Vader that he wanted to make sure the children stayed safe, and on Coruscant they could be kept safe. Sidious was able to get so far with Vader already, he just had to keep twisting the dagger further and further into the chest. For the next dozen years, this would be the continued trend. Sidious would send Vader out on missions to keep him preoccupied. Sidious, as a master manipulator, knew how to make Anakin trust him and leave his children with his master. This made the most prevalent person in Luke and Leia's life, Sidious. He did this because he could promise Vader their safety, which Vader fell for. Luke and Leia were trained in the dark arts over this time, and there was never a show of light within either child. Anakin delved deeper into the dark side and even returned the Mustafar a couple of times to further his knowledge in the dark side of the Force. However, he never constructed the castle on Mustafar, though he would be tasked with taking care of the Cannon Fodder Brigade, otherwise known as the Inquisitorius. On the other hand, Obi-Wan was recovering quite well. He may have not had his lightsaber to fight with, but he was recovering. He spent a number of years constantly inside back to tanks. His skin was able to heal, and aside from a couple scars across his face and his back, he was mostly healed. The only downside was the apparatus he had for breathing. It wasn't too large or too noticeable either. It was a small tank that couldn't even be seen under his robes, that connected from the bottom of his neck and wrapped around his chest. It was a nice tight and snug fit, and it was very comfortable to wear. 
He did have a bit of a warped voice, but it was better than not being able to speak or breathe. At the end of the 12 years, Obon moved from his home inside of the medical freighter and took Archie with him to go out into the galaxy. So much had changed and the Empire was the strongest force that Obon had ever seen in his life. He was unaware but Anakin had killed Yoda about two years before he left the freighter. Yoda realized his time was then or never, and he went out with the intention of killing Sidious and or Vader, but it was far too late. Vader had spent the last 10 years at that point training with Sidious in the dark side. He was more powerful than even Sidious was. Killing Yoda was quite the ego boost, and while Vader would like nothing more than to kill his master, there was an issue. Sidious was viewed by Luke and Leia in extremely high regard. They saw him like an uncle or a grandfather. He could do no wrong. Vader knew that he couldn't get rid of Sidious because of his children. However, he didn't believe that went further than they just liked him. He had no real reason to feel or believe that they liked Sidious more than him. After all, he was their father. R2 and Obi-Wan traveled across the galaxy. What was the plan? They weren't really sure. Obi-Wan knew he couldn't just coax Anakin out of the darkness. Maybe he could. Maybe there was more to this plot than he initially realized, but he didn't have a weapon to fight with. Not for nothing. For Kenobi, it was a last-ditch effort. If he failed, it would pretty much be the end of the Jedi. Obi-Wan wasn't also disconnected from the Force. He was very much so intertwined with it and even further along than he was before his loss to Skywalker on Mustafar. He knew that he had to be out of balance inside of his mind and body. Upon arriving at Coruscant, Obi-Wan would be located almost immediately by one of the Inquisitors, which was unintentional. Obi-Wan had no reason to believe that the Sith would break down the confines of the Rule of Two. Not that the Inquisitors were Sith at all, but it seemed as such to Obi-Wan. Kenobi, through a bit of finesse and talent, was able to take half the lightsaber away from the fifth brother before defeating him in a fight. It may have been years since he held a Jedi weapon, but he was as talented as he ever was. Though there was something to acknowledge about Kenobi, that despite his failure on Mustafar and his ability to come to peace inside of his mind, he was severely limited in his abilities in the Force. He wasn't initially someone gifted with a large amount of midichlorians, so when he burned, he lost a lot more of what he didn't have a significant amount of to begin with. Regardless of these limitations, he was able to defeat a couple of the Inquisitors who happened across him until he found himself inside the Jedi Temple, the home of the Emperor and his two apprentices. That's right, Sidious no longer thought of Vader as his priority. Luke and Leia were the future. They'd be able to ensure his reign lasted for the rest of his life. They were the security blanket against Vader. It was a perfect guise. Regardless, upon his entrance into the former Jedi Temple, Kenobi held an Inquisitor weapon. He and R2 snuck into what was an untouched corridor. There were a lot of renovations done to the temple, but some of the original model work for the Jedi Temple was left untouched, simply because Sidious didn't frequent the halls all that much, and they were just kind of out of the way anyways. R2 and Obi-Wan talked about what they could do. It was clear there was a darkness inside the temple, but they needed to prove the Emperor and his people weren't who they said they were. Perhaps Obi-Wan asked if R2 could break into the public broadcast system and display an image of what happened to the galaxy. Sure, he is a Jedi, might die, and it would likely be a painful death. His hope is that the galaxy would see that Sidious lied to them. Because Obi-Wan understood one thing. The general public of the galaxy didn't understand the difference between Sith and Jedi. Of course, there were plenty that did, many of which preferred the Jedi over the Sith, but if he could show the galaxy that Sidious was simply a darker version of Dooku, it could turn heads against him. Perhaps it was too late, but they had to try. It was their only shot. It would take a couple hours, but R2 would crack the code, and the two of them would sneak their way over to the throne room. R2 had very simple instructions. Don't interfere. Allow everything to play out naturally, and make sure the galaxy saw it. Obi-Wan knelt down and put his hands on top of R2 and thanked the little droid for being his only friend throughout his entire endeavor. R2 was more Obi-Wan's droid than he ever was Anakin's, having spent so much more time with Kenobi over the last 12 years. The two of them had this really natural bond, and it would be the light to restore the hope in the galaxy, they hoped. They broke off and R2 got a good spot where he could watch everything unfold. Obi-Wan walked up the steps of the throne room. Vader was standing before his master, who sat idly on the throne, with Luke and Leia playing on the floor beside his chair. They were both 12 years old, but with Palpatine, they got whatever they wanted. Vader felt Obi-Wan's presence and turned around with a flash of his robes bouncing through the air. Kenobi stopped in his tracks. He held the blade that belonged to the Inquisitor and prepared to ignite it. Vader was shocked. How had he survived? Anakin's distaste for the Jedi was higher than it could have ever been before, and seeing Kenobi only brightened that fire. Obi-Wan looked beyond Anakin and saw Sidious for the first time, but he then locked eyes with the two golden-eyed children. Luke and Leia were confused. Who was this man? Then in one solitary moment, everything clicked for Obi-Wan. He knew Anakin wasn't privy to this, and if he was, he was looking for a way out of it. Vader's stance showed offense, and Obi-Wan knew at this point that there was no way he could hold his own against the likes of Vader. He had to make an example out of something. How could he? There was an eerie silence as Skywalker asked why Obi-Wan would come back. Kenobi didn't even believe what he was about to say, but maybe it would resonate with Vader. He told his former pupil that he came back believing there was good in Anakin. 
Vader shook his head, his anger grew. Obi-Wan remembered learning from R2 after he first came out of the back to tank that Padme died. It was a very hard day for him, it was the first time he stood on his feet in months, and he learned that one of his eldest friends died in an assassination on Naboo. Obi-Wan was under the belief that the child, or what was actually children, died in the assassination as well. The dots began to click more and more, and everything became too neatly tied together. It couldn't be a coincidence. Kenobi could tell that Sidious was a master manipulator, and he wanted Vader to believe everything that was told to him, which clearly at this point, Vader did. So despite Obi-Wan and R2's plan in action, Obi-Wan would have to stall long enough to get Anakin to see that Sidious did not care for him. It would need a select few words. He'd have to be wiser than he'd ever been. But Kenobi had 12 years to think about the words to say. He knew exactly how he would frame this argument. Kenobi ignited a crimson blade and Vader followed suit, as Sidious and Luke and Leia watched in excitement. Luke and Leia had never seen a real fight, aside from the time Vader abused the Inquisitors during a training session. Sidious showed excitement for this confrontation, and he got the children to watch. Kenobi and Skywalker walked around in a circle before the first strike was thrown. Right after that, another one. It was slow, cautious, and nothing at all similar to their fight on Mustafar. Obi-Wan knew that Anakin was playing with his food. Likely he hadn't seen a real challenge in years. This of course being Obi-Wan unaware of Yoda's demise. Obi-Wan began speaking to Skywalker, telling him everything Vader would have expected to hear. The Sith were lying to him, they were manipulating the galaxy and him. Sidious was using him and trying to use his children. This actually pissed off Vader. He didn't believe it to be true, but there was a part of him that knew Kenobi was telling a truth. He could see it. The more he went on missions requested by the Emperor, the more he saw his children turn away from him and go further into the darkness to what his master wanted them to be. But Anakin never learned, so he responded with anger towards Obi-Wan, throwing him off his feet. Before Obi-Wan met a cold death, he looked up and suggested that is why Padme was killed on Naboo. This was something that never crossed his mind, not all the years he was Vader, after knowing that Sidious was behind everything. Anakin had to beeline for Obi-Wan's chest and swiftly move the blade so he wouldn't kill Obi-Wan, but it cut through the outer layer of his ribs. Obi-Wan winced in pain, but he could see Anakin stagger back. Sidious could see the change the moment it happened, but as it was with Yoda, Sidious wanted to kill Kenobi himself. Obi-Wan had evaded his plans long enough, and it was time for the last council member to die. Kenobi looked over as Sidious drifted to his feet, stepping past the twins and walking to Obi-Wan and blasting with electricity. Sidious told Skywalker that he was a powerful Sith. His doing would bring an end to the Jedi. Their time was nigh. With the end of Kenobi, the religion would become extinct. Sure, there were others out there likely, but they didn't stand a chance without someone like Obi-Wan. Sidious stopped. Steam rolled off of Obi-Wan. His breathing felt broken again, though his respirator was just being electrocuted. So, while the electricity was bad, it was like being suffocated and electrocuted at the same time. It really kind of sucked. Something for Vader clicked. He remembered that Dooku was Sidious' student, and Dooku was ordered to assassinate Padme, which meant that Palpatine, he was behind it. Her death was on his hands. A number of thoughts ran through his mind as Sidious told Obi-Wan that he would die. Electricity rained out of his hands and Anakin ignited his lightsaber and lifted it above his head. One would imagine this would destroy Sidious in one strike, but it didn't. Anakin was filled with pain, but that pain didn't come from Sidious, it came from his children. Two lightsabers had ignited and Luke and Leia nailed their blades through Anakin's leg, one in the upper thigh and the other in the calf. Anakin winced and fell to the ground, looking over with betrayal filling his heart. Could it be true? He heard the electricity stop and said he's turned over with a hideous grin. He twisted his head as if he was saying, did you expect anything less? Luke and Leia were Sidious' children. They were under his evil spell and before Anakin could destroy the Sith Lord, everything he had fell out from under him. The worst part is that while their lightsaber cuts hurt, it didn't hurt as much as a sense of betrayal he felt looking back and seeing his children betraying him. Anakin looked over at Obi-Wan, he pushed himself up, holding his chest with one of his hands and sliding the lightsaber of the Inquisitor over towards Skywalker. This was his moment. Skywalker used a force with the little leverage he had and pushed himself to his feet and ignited both of the weapons again to confront Sidious. Anakin landed on his one good leg and placed the other out gently. This didn't bode well for him. Out of the corner of the room, out of the vase, two lightsabers lifted up and ignited into Sidious's hands. The two of them were in for the long haul. Sidious told the children to stay behind him. He would protect them from Lord Vader. This only aggravated Vader more than he could ever imagine. Sidious had to be on the defensive here. He knew, just as Vader did, that Vader was far more powerful than he. Sidious had the experience though. He was a powerhouse of the Sith. He could make Skywalker suffer and he planned on doing so. Their blades sped into each other's, each of them a master of their art. And Skywalker knew he could easily win this, but he also could screw this up so quickly too. They danced around and Vader was left on the echoes of his children cheering on Sidious. It made him mental. Obi-Wan tried getting to his feet, like that would help. 
and as he did, Luke and Leia saw their first prey, both of them using the force and launching Kenobi out of the throne room, and ignited their own weapons and beginning their head hunt for Obi-Wan Kenobi. What fun! Skywalker noticed this, but he couldn't do anything to stop it. His hands and arms were moving faster than the speed of light. The skill displayed between Sith Lords was remarkable. It was a faster and more intense fight than Vader vs. Yoda or Yoda vs. Sidious. The dark side swelled in the room and they both thrived off of it. Down the hall, Obi-Wan was limping away. He knew he couldn't risk harming or even imposing a threat to either of them. But these little demon children were bloodthirsty and he was trying to keep his distance. It didn't do him any good when he came across a couple of royal guards who were wondering why Obi-Wan Kenobi was inside of the temple. They prepared the strike until they were cut down by Luke and Leia. They were the spawn of the Sith, and it was because of Sidious. Not even Vader would have taught his twins to have such a disregard for life. Sidious and Vader got into a more tense duel. Their blades slammed together and their eyes locked in a heated disgust. Anakin expressed his disbelief for Sidious' lies towards him, and Sidious mocked him, telling him that even if he kills him, the legacy of Palpatine will live on through the twins. This was a final straw. Skywalker brought the blade around and cracked it down on Sidious' spine and cut the Sith Lord down. For R2, this wasn't exactly the plan, but it was broadcasted. The entire Empire just watched Anakin kill Palpatine, and there was a noticeable shock. The ISB went into complete disarray, and a vie for power began as Imperial fleets left their stations and broke off for Coruscant. Anakin, on the hand, ran around the corner and searched for his twins. What lured him towards them was their little laughs. These little evil twins sounded just like they were Sidious. They laughed in a menacing way. Anakin sped up and ran around the corner, seeing the children preparing to kill Obi-Wan. There was some bad blood between him and his former teacher, but he couldn't let the twins kill him. Skywalker lifted the twins up in the air with the Force and ripped their lightsabers away from them. Anakin looked over at Obi-Wan, whose face showed a sign of relief. This initially confused Anakin because it seemed like Obi-Wan wasn't able to fend off the children. In reality, Obi-Wan didn't want to push Anakin further into the darkness. Before a word could be said, R2 rolled around the corner and beeped at them. The Empire was coming. They had to go. Vader sedated his children and put his hand out for Kenobi. He knew in the moment they had to just let everything from the past go, so they could escape at least. Time for apologies would come later. They ran into the hangar bay as stormtroopers descended on the Emperor's throne room. Skywalker placed his kids inside of the Emperor's shuttle, and it lifted off and vanished from Coruscant into hyperspace. Once the ship was in hyperspace, Anakin came to the bay where the twins and Obi-Wan were. Kenobi was bent over, and R2 was right next to him, placing a Bacta injection into his veins. R2 didn't even look over in Anakin's direction. So much bad blood between them as well. But Obi-Wan, he did. Their entire friendship lasted for 13 years, and for the last 12 years, they were nothing but strangers. Anakin searched for the words to say. He assumed Obi-Wan died at the bottom of the lava river, and that was that. But it clearly wasn't the fate that beset his former master. Anakin tried to speak, and Obi-Wan spoke up and apologized. Maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe it wasn't even his fault. But Kenobi spoke from the heart. He believed that he wronged his student. That there was a flaw in his teaching that led Anakin down this path. Because as a Jedi, it was his responsibility. They looked at each other. There was so much darkness from inside Anakin, and he might never come back from the light. But Obi-Wan figured he might as well say the last words he wanted to before Anakin killed him. But Anakin simply sat down on the other side of the bay and looked at Obi-Wan. He cleared his throat and searched for the words to respond with. His eyes drifted from the floor to the ceiling. The first moment of real vulnerability since Padme died. He hadn't seen her family since her death. And they hadn't seen their grandchildren or niece and nephew since Padme died either. Between the flash of memories and the sight before his eyes, Anakin told Obi-Wan that he was not his failure. Anakin looked away, covering a tear sitting below his eye, as he told his former master that the destruction of Anakin Skywalker came from within, not from Obi-Wan. Anakin at that time believed he should have gone down the dark path, and he did, when in reality it only gave him a life full of suffering. It turned his wife into a tombstone, it threw his children to the clutches of the Sith, and their evil teachings, and now he was reaping the pain of his mistakes. Skywalker looked back at his former master and told him that despite all the people he killed and murdered, all the atrocious things he did, all the pain he inflicted, the one thing he wished for the most, but didn't believe he deserved, was the friendship of Obi-Wan Kenobi. It wasn't about Jedi or Sith, it was about brotherhood. And with no one else in his life aside from his corrupted children, he had no one. And he told his master that he would do anything to make it up, for the pain that he inflicted, just so he could have an ounce of what was before it all went away. Obi-Wan looked over at Anakin. The back that was setting in and was finally able to feel a little bit of relief in his body. He told Anakin that it would take time, but there was always an opportunity for them to reunite. Obi-Wan reached out his hand and Anakin did too. They met in the middle of the Bay Area and their hands clutched each other. Anakin wished he could hold on forever because he never wanted to let go again. There are many nights he wished he'd given Obi-Wan an easy way out. 
on many more that he wished he never fought Obi-Wan and listened to him. Maybe things with Padme would have played out the same, but he would at least still have Obi-Wan. Maybe not Padme, but he knew Obi-Wan would have never left his side or ever make him feel like he would betray him. What could have been? The Empire, on the other hand, was brought into an emergency session under the visor of the Empire. Masa Meda. He told the Senate and the Empire that despite the visuals shown in the message seen around the galaxy, the Empire would remain strong and would not crumble. <laughs> it did. A moment after he said that, the entire Senate building was blown into oblivion. The Empire was a fractured system without Palpatine. It was built to be that way. Because Palpatine wanted to be the centerpiece. There was no Empire without him. The irony is, is there was a genuine backlash to Palpatine, because he was just seen using the Force, which made people believe that he was another dark Jedi like Dooku. Or for everyone who actually knew, he had Sith. This completely swayed the public trust away from anything Palpatine did. Though luckily, through the Imperial Military Industrial Complex, there were plenty of leaders waiting for their moment. The two largest players were Grand Moff Tarkin and Grand Admiral Thrawn. The two of them had a disliking for each other, and while Thrawn wasn't stupid enough to engage with another Imperial figurehead, Tarkin was. It also proved that Tarkin wasn't as well liked either, because Thrawn was so much more likable as an admiral. He wasn't a suck-up and he was very tactically smart. Shortly after the destruction of the Senate building, a civil war would erupt. The Imperial fleets coming back to Coruscant would end up right on the front lines of the Second Battle of Coruscant. There hadn't been an attack on Coruscant for generations, and now there were two in the span of a dozen years. It showed how terrible Palpatine really was for the galaxy, and especially for Coruscant. Through the chaos of the battle, Thrawn would come out on top. Tarkin was destroyed, but it didn't mean that there was an end to the conflict. It just meant that there was an established leader for the Empire. There was also the very easily influenced Inquisitors, who under Grand Inquisitor sided with Thrawn, which was a smart choice to make. While Thrawn was a brilliant tactician, he wasn't a politician, and this left him looking for someone to appoint to the command of politics. He brought in Moff Gideon from the Outer Rim to do that. He may have not had a good grip on core world politics, but he was loyal and incredibly smart, which is all Thrawn really needed at this moment. Obi-Wan and Anakin would land in the Outer Rim and say their goodbyes. Anakin didn't want to say goodbye, but Obi-Wan knew it was time for them to go their own separate ways. In the future, they might cross paths again, but that much was unknown. Obi-Wan was going to search for surviving Jedi amongst the stars, and he knew that for Anakin, that wasn't something he could do. Obi-Wan wished his former pupil well on his endeavors, and told him that if he ever needed him, look to the stars. He was out there, but he was always here. Obi-Wan gestured to his chest and turned away. R2 followed right behind as Anakin turned over to where his kids were. They were still sedated. He had a lot on his hands. Over the coming months, R2 and Obi-Wan would begin their journey to rebuild a fallen order. This would start with the finding of Cal Kestis and Ser Junda. They were both together by this point, and they showed interest in assisting Master Kenobi. His facial scars and his determination told them everything they needed to know about the once former council member. Obi-Wan's brother, on the other hand, began going through his new fatherly duties, undoing all the carnage he allowed to happen under his own fatherhood. For him, he felt what it must have felt like to be Obi-Wan. He was shown a mirror, and it was put to his face. Just because Anakin moved away from the path of the Sith didn't mean he didn't use the dark side. He was just much more loyal to the light than he could have ever been to the dark. He saw what it did to him and what it cost him, and of course, the most damaging, what it did to his children. Luke and Leia were gremlins, and would continue to be as such for the longer part of a couple years. It'd be Anakin's personal purgatory. He had to literally love the hate out of them, which sounds easy when talking about kids, but it wasn't. They were manipulated by the most vile man in the galaxy, and they were still his servants. His twisted lies wound deep into their very beings. Anakin had to break those chains, while breaking free from his own. It also hurt to note that his very own children were constantly plotting against him. There were several times where Luke or Leia or even both of them almost killed him, sometimes by trying to poison his food, other times by literally trying to stab him in his sleep. It was his penance for what he cost the galaxy. The Empire, on the other hand, would become more of a military state, and all the while it was becoming more dormant than it was under Palpatine. See, Thrawn was loyal to the Emperor, but as he understood, the Emperor was a part of the Greater Senate and the Empire. So, for Thrawn, he didn't chase becoming a leader, he sought to rebuild the Imperial Senate and hoped it would restructure itself from there on out. In turn, the galaxy was filled with a lot more caring people than evil people. It would take time, but eventually the Imperial Senate would return without the rule of an Emperor, being that Thrawn felt no Imperial officer should hold so much power, not even himself. At a time without an incessant rebellion or alliance, it made much more sense for him to do it as such. Had there been a resistance, this might have been a much different scenario for Thrawn and his Empire. The Imperial Senate never changed any of his rules regarding Jedi. Though there was a great change after records were made public, what Palpatine was building on Wayland at Mount Tantus, as well as his Jakku facilities, were revealed to the Imperial Senate. And while Exegol wasn't a place they could just find, they got the picture. The hunt for the Force-sensitive beings were put to an end, and the Inquisitors were tasked not as Sith or agents of hunting Jedi, but as a unit to resolve and help Force-sensitive individuals find their way. 
for Grand Inquisitor, this didn't pan out for him the way he wanted, and so he attempted a hostile takeover, though he and the rest of the Inquisitorius were killed by a blur. It was another event, quite like Palpatine's death, and it was being broadcast galaxy-wide. The Inquisitors took over the Senate and were trying to claim their right to the throne of Palpatine, being true Sith and his true successors. They were slaughtered, and it was by a road man, wielding what was now a white lightsaber. Anakin Skywalker came all the way out from the mid-rim to defeat the Inquisitors and then go back into hiding. And of course, the true Sith Lord was not much of anything. Just a man stuck on Malachor, left to die because of Palpatine. Sidious had the Empire destroy the Crimson Dawn about two years before his death, and Maul was thrown on the Malachor to die. Without anyone going to Malachor, he would indeed die there. Anakin would, by his mid-30s, find himself a new partner, and obviously after bringing his children back into a normal mind, he would remarry. You think you'd bring a woman into that hellhole? No. Those little devils would have killed her. So once they were angels, he remarried, and for the first time in their young lives, Luke and Leia would actually have a mother figure. For the Jedi, their ancient rival and the Sith had been extinguished, which was very obviously a positive thing. However, the number of Jedi in the Growing Order was very little. Obi-Wan, after all of his trial and tribulations, felt called to reignite the flame of the Jedi. He traversed the galaxy with Cal and Seer, finding relics of the past on Ahch to Lothal and Jedha, though they went back to the barely standing relic on Tython. By the time they got the Tython, their order was only four, the only addition being young Ezra Bridger, a boy found on the planet of Lothal. The years would be rough for the Jedi, but without Force Sensitives being hunted, they would actually have a real chance at restoring their formerly lost order in a new era full of potential under the Empire. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galloping Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Tim Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, The Eternal Padawan, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Mad Manny Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, the man with three first names, Dark Saint 46, Aaron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash the like button. Uh, if you want to support me in other ways, go check out the Patreon. Let's talk about the story. So obviously, I know the main thing that people are probably going to mention is why wasn't it Bail Organa or Ahsoka that saved Obi-Wan? Well, I've got something with Ahsoka on Mustafar coming up soon, so I didn't want to just make that parallel too obvious. But I, I thought R2 would actually be a really interesting thing for, for Obi-Wan to be saved by. Because R2 is kind of going through the same thing that Obi-Wan went through, right? He's being abandoned by Anakin. And so they have a level of similarity there. And I, I genuinely think that Anakin could completely forget that R2 is there. Just because he could. He could just be like, oh, yeah, that's right. I gotta go save my wife. And then he would just completely forget about R2, which is entirely plausible. It's also entirely not plausible. And I figured it'd be just different to do it that way. Just to have R2 kind of save him, I think that would just be an interesting dynamic. I also didn't want to take them to a planet like Polis Masa. I really wanted this to feel a lot different in its route. And I wanted Palpatine to kind of have his own victory in his own way and allow that victory to kind of supersede anything. And the main thing is I wanted to focus on Palpatine's manipulation tactics. Obviously at the end of the story, Anakin does get his happy ending, but it's not through his own trials and tribulations for, you know, kind of killing all the Jedi. You know, he has to kind of go through his own mirroring process of seeing what Palpatine did to him but through his own children and having to resolve that for them as he's trying to fix himself and make himself a better person. And it was very intentionally done that way. For this particular story, I kind of mimicked what we saw in What If Sidious Abandoned Anakin on Mustafar, but I took it a different way. Obviously, I don't think Obi-Wan has enough strength to actually get himself out of there. Um, even with like all of his limbs, I think I think just bare, bare skin after being burnt like that wouldn't be able to climb up like Anakin's metallic arm would. And that's kind of like the main difference there. Uh, between Anakin actually being able to ascend and Obi-Wan not being able to ascend, and just kind of the difference between Anakin and Obi-Wan in the story, both of them being abandoned on Mustafar. Obviously, Sidious doesn't go to Mustafar because he doesn't have that feeling of, I sense Lord Vader's in great danger or whatever, so I don't think he's going to go to Mustafar because he's not sensing Anakin in danger. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. This was a fun video, a uh, fun different scenario that we see on Mustafar, something completely different that I don't think's ever been done before. I got another one like that coming out on Tuesday for the Ahsoka premiere. Anyways, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.